Welcome to Butterflies of the Biosphere. Today I'm with Neil Hume. Good afternoon. And my son, Indiana Danahar. Hi. Well, Neil, you brought us to the Gallops uh, near Friston Forest. That's not in the Biosphere, is it? No, that's because we've come out looking for uh, our target species today, the Chalk Hill Blue, under leaden skies. So we really needed to find a site where we could be absolutely certain of finding the butterfly, even though it's at roost. And although this Chalk Hill Blue is widespread and relatively common within the biosphere, we've come all the way out here to Friston Gallops because this is an exceptional site and we knew that we were going to find Chalk Hill Blues in abundance here, and we have. Yeah, and when you say exceptional, there have been times when it's been truly exceptional, haven't there? Yeah, well today we're, we've probably seen in the, in the region of two to 3,000 butterflies on the wing uh, during the few spells where the sun has broken through the cloud and they've become active. But in exceptional years, such as 2012, we've seen the butterfly here in really Victorian abundances. And uh, we actually surveyed the site using uh, a system of random one meter squares, multiplied that up using satellite imagery. And it's, it's debatable the accuracy of, of such methods. But uh, when I first looked at the site on the 2nd of August, 2012, I came up with a figure of between 150 and 200,000 just for this northern end of the open grassland area. And the following day, Michael Blenko and Mike Mullis did a much more thorough survey of the entire site and came up with a figure of 827,897 butterflies. That's remarkable. And when you uh, talk about the Victorians, of course, this presents all kinds of opportunities, doesn't it? Well, it does, because when you see the Chalk Hill Blue in these sort of numbers, by sifting through the butterflies once they're asleep, you can then hopefully come across aberrant forms. And these were highly prized by the collect collectors. Um, they'd fetch uh, quite a lot of money. And of course, they're still highly prized today by photographers. Uh, and some of these aberrant forms are given names as well. Uh, they're given scientific names. And the one that we're after this afternoon is called post -kaika. And uh, the names actually mean something. So post refers to the hind wing and kaika means blind, i.e. it doesn't have the normal eyed spots over the hind wing and this is quite a regularly occurring form on this site. Right. Well I'm really excited about going to see those. Should we have a look? Yeah, let's go and find one. Okay. What's that, Neil? It's one of the aberrant forms that uh, we've been looking for this afternoon. And although it's not an extreme form, you can see that it's got greatly reduced spotting over the hind wing there. Uh, it could be given a name, uh, but without consulting the monograph, and uh, there is a monograph on these things, hundreds and hundreds of different aberrant forms have been named. And there's probably a, a good deal more which haven't been named, but we're hoping really to find something a bit more extreme than this. That's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. That's the best one yet. There we are. That's what we've come for. A far more extreme aberrant form here. And I've watched this one flutter down to roost in the grass. And it was quite clear as it did so that it's not only missing spots on the underside of the hind wing, but also the underside of the forewing as well. So this one's actually given the name Kaika, blind, but blind both on the underside of the fore and hind wing. So it's a more extreme form and in my opinion, more beautiful. So we've done pretty well tonight. What have we got there now? Well, while we've been looking for these Chalk Hill Blue Aberrants, I suddenly noticed this little chap sitting on my trousers. And this is the Essex Skipper. And a lot of people do have difficulties in actually telling the difference between the Essex Skipper and the Small Skipper. So I'm just going to point out the diagnostic features. And the important thing is, is the colour of the underside, the underside, I stress, of the tips of the antennae. And in the Essex Skipper, they appear shiny, glossy black. Just going to show you those. 
So it doesn't matter what color the antennal tips are from above, they can be anywhere between golden and very dark in both species, but it's the underside, the color of the underside of those antennal tips. And you can see there, glossy black, that means it's the Essex. So then, Neil, uh, why were there so many butterflies here in 2012? Well, 2012 was a, a terrible year, if you remember, for weather, and ter a terrible year for just about every other species. In fact, there, there were only two winners. One was the Chalk Hill Blue and the other one was the Red Admiral. And I think the reason that the Chalk Hill Blues thrived that year was because the uh, very damp, uh, humid summer promoted the growth of its food plant, which yeah. is horseshoe vetch. Yeah. So whereas I suspect in most years, the amount of horseshoe vetch is the limiting factor on the population. Generally, there won't be enough to go around for all the caterpillars. Yeah. Um, on that particular year, there was probably an abundance of nitrogen rich, bushy horseshoe vetch yeah. and rarely sufficiently enough to actually feed a whole army of chalk hill blue caterpillars. And I think that's probably the reason that so many caterpillars managed to survive reach maturity, pupate, and then produce this fantastic profusion of adult chalk hill blues. So, Indy, you had a question for Neil, didn't you? Why the male and females have different colours? That's a good question. It's called sexual dimorphism, and um, it doesn't occur in all species. Uh, for instance, the red admiral, the male and the female look pretty much the same, but we see extreme sexual dimorphism, i.e. differences between the sexes in a lot of the blue species, including the chalk hill. And I think uh, one of the main reasons for that is that brown females will heat up more rapidly than the iridescent pale blue males. And that gives the females an advantage because, of course, the females, her job is just to lay her eggs as quickly as possible. And um, if she's a dark brown colour, she will become active earlier in the morning and perhaps be able to fly later in the day when the males are shutting up shop earlier on, the females will continue to fly. And that's because that brown coloration keeps them warmer. It allows them to absorb heat from the sun more rapidly. And we see it in several other species as well. So it's probably a technique for allowing the female to remain active for longer. Neil, um, do you ever see much variation in a particular species like the common blue uh, and it's the female's color? Yeah, definitely. Um, in all of these blues where we do see sexual dimorphism there is a sort of a range a natural variation in terms of uh, the coloration of, of females adonis blues chalk hill blues females they do occasionally show a little bit of blue coloration particularly in particular populations um, but the common blue is quite a good example because we do see a, a very large range in the degree of blue coloration in the female common blue and i think that there's a chance that that's been changing over the last few decades, perhaps in response to climate change, because the female common blue has always been highly variable in terms of how much blue and how much brown she's got on her wings. But we do seem to be seeing, um, certainly particularly this year, a huge proportion of female common blues, which are almost entirely blue. So I just wonder whether that is a, a reaction to increasing uh, temperatures. Well, there's a research project for someone there. For sure. Neil, thanks a lot. That was a really exciting experience and I don't suppose we'd have so much uh, enjoyment or much luck if we hadn't been with you finding those aberrations. It was really good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. A pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, although we're, we're not in a biosphere here, are we? Uh, and you said that the chalk hill blue is fairly common wherever you go on good quality chalk grass. And, but if you had to name some sites, where would you suggest within the biosphere? For East Sussex, I'd probably say Castle Hill, that's a good site to go to, and West Sussex, Mill Hill, that's well known and accessible. And uh, although the numbers are nowhere uh, as large as they used to be, it's a good dependable site. Fantastic. Well, look, if uh, you see another Chalk Hill Blue, either in uh, the biosphere or in fact just a bit beyond, we'd be really pleased to hear about it. So uh, please put your sightings on the uh, Butterflies of the Biosphere Facebook page or even on uh, the sightings page of Butterfly Conservation. Neil, it's been absolutely fantastic. By the way, Neil, um, why is this place called Butcher's Hole Bottom? What, you, you haven't heard, Dan? No. We need to be out of here before dark. Come on. <laughs>